Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Their Own Words. History from those who lived it. My name is Danny. And I'm Ava. Today, we're going to be talking about Charles Darwin, and more specifically, reading from his diary. Only, this is a remarkable diary in that it was published into a book in 1839 and was called Journal and Remarks. Now, it's since been renamed and is more widely known as Voyage of the Beagle. The Voyage of the Beagle would be the publication that would make Charles Darwin famous. This book was very widely read, and for those thinking his theory of evolution is what made him famous, not initially, that would come later. Charles Darwin was an English biologist and naturalist who was born in February of 1809 and died in April of 1882. And as probably most people know, he was famously associated with the theory of evolution. The Voyage of the Beagle, which, as Danny said, we'll be reading from today, details Darwin's voyage aboard a ship of the British Royal Navy, named the HMS Beagle, which began in 1831. On this voyage, he was employed as a naturalist. Darwin spent a majority of the trip on land collecting samples of plants, animals, rocks, and fossils. He explored areas in Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and remote islands, most notably the Galapagos. He collected specimens in these places and brought them back to England. If you took high school biology, the Galapagos Islands and Darwin may sound like a familiar pairing to you. It was here that he noticed that there were various species of finches on each island, whose beak shapes varied from one island to the next, and it was from these observations on these islands that Darwin developed his theory of natural selection. The subject of natural selection, though, would be reserved for his most famous work on the origin of species, which was published in 1859. It's from Darwin and his origin of species that we actually get the term survival of the fittest, which really has embedded itself into our vocabulary. Now, he does write about the Galapagos finches in The Voyage of the Beagle, although in the first edition, he writes that, quote, there is not space in this work to enter into this curious subject, end quote. He would elaborate a bit more on the finches in later editions. The one we're reading from today is from 1845, so there is a bit more context in this edition, which we'll read for you. Charles Darwin was very curious and adventurous. The risks of jumping on a Royal Navy vessel and heading across the ocean to explore the world were very high at the time, but he didn't let that deter him from making his scientific discoveries. Actually, if you've ever seen the Russell Crowe film Master and Commander, which is possibly the greatest movie ever made, You'll notice that Stephen, the ship's doctor and the naturalist on board, is essentially a character based on the life of Charles Darwin. And you get a good idea of what the risks were in going on one of these boats. Okay, so with that context out of the way, let's get to reading some excerpts from The Voyage on the Beagle. Okay, so reading from Chapter 1, St. Diego, Cape Verde Islands. Darwin writes, After having been twice driven back by heavy southwestern gales, Her Majesty's ship Beagle, a 10-gun brig, under the command of Captain Fitzroy, sailed from Devonport on the 27th of December, 1831. The object of the expedition was to complete the survey of Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego, commenced under Captain King in 1826 to 1830, to survey the shores of Chile, Peru, and of some islands in the Pacific, and to carry a chain of chronometrical measurements round the world. On the 16th of January, 1832, we anchored at Porto Praia in St. Diego, the chief island of the Cape Verde archipelago. The island would generally be considered as very uninteresting, but to anyone accustomed only to an English landscape, the novel aspect of an utterly sterile land possesses a grandeur which more vegetation might spoil. A single green leaf can scarcely be discovered over wide tracts of the lava plains, yet flocks of goats, together with a few cows, contrive to exist. It rains very seldom, but during a short portion of the year, heavy torrents fall, and immediately afterwards, a light vegetation springs out of every crevice. This soon withers, and upon such naturally formed hay, the animals live. It had not now rained for an entire year. When the island was discovered, the immediate neighborhood of Porto Praia was clothed with trees, the reckless destruction of which has caused here, as at St. Helena, and at some of the Canary Islands, almost entire sterility. The broad, flat-bottomed valleys, many of which serve during a few days only in the season as watercourses, are clothed with thickets of leafless bushes. Few living creatures inhabit these valleys, 
The commonest bird is a kingfisher, which tamely sits on the branches of the castor oil plant, and thence darts on grasshoppers and lizards. It is brightly colored, but not so beautiful as the European species. In its flight, manners, and place of habitation, which is generally in the driest valley, there is also a wide difference. So already we're getting a picture here of Charles Darwin as the naturalist, somebody who's very observant about the surroundings to which he's been just dropped into. And you can get a sense of why this would be so interesting to somebody reading this in England, because most people would never have had the chance to visit some of these places. They might never have seen images of some of these places. So the images that Darwin is relating in his book here are, for some people, the only experience they'll get of these islands. So, continuing on. In the course of an hour, we arrived at Ribiera Grande, and were surprised at the sight of a large ruined fort and cathedral. This little town, before its harbour was filled up, was the principal place on the island. It now presents a melancholy but very picturesque appearance. Having procured a black padre for a guide, and a Spaniard who had served in the Peninsular War as an interpreter, we visited a collection of buildings of which an ancient church formed the principal part. It is here the governors and captain generals of the islands have been buried. Some of the tombstones recorded dates of the 16th century. The heraldic ornaments were the only things in this retired place that reminded us of Europe. The church or chapel formed one side of a quadrangle, in the middle of which a large clump of bananas were growing. On another side was a hospital, containing about a dozen miserable-looking inmates. We returned to the Venda to eat our dinners. A considerable number of men, women, and children, all as black as jet, collected to watch us. Our companions were extremely merry, and everything we said or did was followed by their hearty laughter. Before leaving the town, we visited the cathedral. It does not appear so rich as the smaller church, but boasts of a little organ, which sent forth singularly inharmonious cries. We presented the black priest with a few shillings, and the Spaniard, patting him on the head, said, with much candor, he thought his color made no great difference. We then returned, as fast as the ponies would go, to Porto Praia. I wanted us to read this excerpt because I thought it was a really interesting look at the societal and cultural aspects of the environment that Darwin was being exposed to. We might think in the 1840s that Darwin and the Beagle's crew, given the nature of what they were doing, were only visiting uninhabited places. And I think living in the 2000s, we often think, oh, 200 years ago, that's such a long time ago. And all these places, particularly in West Africa, where Cape Verde is located, would have been undiscovered when in fact they were quote unquote discovered in the 1600s, 400 years before that. Mm -hmm. And yet here they are visiting churches and, and they have buildings and hospitals and they are meeting with the villagers, the people of the island. So there is very much a civilization present on this island. Yeah, that's true. It, it does, however, also seem like this outpost of the Portuguese empire is maybe in decline at this point, which is interesting to note. Like there are fewer Portuguese people here now, it seems like, and more natives who are maybe occupying the place. He's talking about the ruins of a church, but that, like you said, this has been discovered a while ago because there are graves dating back to the 16th century. So there's not just evidence of a civilization and a society here, but actually a pretty old one. Yeah, that's an interesting point you bring up, because actually this island, which itself seems quite inhospitable, was uninhabited until the Portuguese came in the 16th century, and from here, the Portuguese lived there for 200 years and they brought many slaves with them. So when I was researching, I found out that a major reason for this decline that you've picked up on is that this was a major slave trading port. And so as a result of the British cracking down on the Atlantic slave trade in the 1800s, Porto Praia and the surrounding area experienced a major economic decline. And many of the Portuguese settlers actually left. So it's really interesting how not only has this place had a civilization but it's even got to the point where now that civilization is in decline it's almost like the civilization has had a life already mm -hmm. and it's dying in some ways but obviously we know today that cape verde is still a country and yes. there's still people there so it survived in some way but definitely was in a period of transition here when darwin's visiting it seems mm -hmm. like I also want to comment on something else you sort of mentioned earlier, Danny, how Darwin reflects on the landscape as being something remarkable that he should write about. 
For people back in England who have never seen anything apart from lush farmlands and forests, they likely couldn't even picture what Darwin was saying here when he says, you know, a single green leaf can scarcely be discovered over wide tracts of the lava plains. They would really have to use their imagination here because what they're used to is so far from what Darwin is experiencing. Yeah, and I think I mentioned this earlier, but for them at this time in history, reading was a form of travel for people. And for many people, it was the only experience of the wider world they would ever get. And speaking of that experience, one aspect that Charles Darwin is also taking care to relate is the interactions he's having with people of another race, which is quite unique for somebody coming from Victorian England. So he goes on to say, Fuentes, which is another village they visited, Fuentes is a pretty village with a small stream, and everything appeared to prosper well, excepting, indeed, that which ought to do so most, its inhabitants. The black children, completely naked and looking very wretched, were carrying bundles of firewood half as big as their own bodies. And he goes on to write about another village called St. Domingo. The scenery of St. Domingo possesses a beauty totally unexpected, from the prevalent gloomy character of the rest of the island. The village is situated at the bottom of a valley, bounded by lofty and jagged walls of stratified lava. The black rocks afford a most striking contrast with the bright green vegetation, which follows the banks of a little stream of clear water. It happened to be a grand feast day, and the village was full of people. On our return, we overtook a party of about 20 young black girls, dressed in excellent taste, their black skins and snow-white linen being set off by colored turbans and large shawls. As soon as we approached near, they suddenly all turned round, and covering the path with their shawls, sung with great energy a wild song, beating time with their hands upon their legs. We threw them some vintems, which were received with screams of laughter, and we left them redoubling the noise of their song. So vintems, by the way, are a type of Portuguese coin. Okay, so Ava, what do we think about this excerpt? I think this is another interesting look into the cultural aspect of the island. Because we just read an excerpt where we essentially talked about the fact that they actually have a civilization here. It's not quote unquote undiscovered, as many people might think. And we talked about the fact that this is a culture or a civilization that was largely imprinted upon Cape Verde by the Portuguese. And yet here we have the other side where there's a more traditional energy as well. So he talks about girls singing a wild song, beating time with their hands upon their legs. He talks about the colored turbans and large shawls. And this would have been not of the colonial influence. This would have been very traditionally African. And so I think it's kind of a neat contrast to read both of those excerpts where we see the colonial influence in the cathedrals, the churches, maybe even the hospitals. And then we see that more traditional influence in the brightly colored shawls and turbans and then the traditional songs and dancing. Mm -hmm. There's a crossing of cultures here. Mm -hmm. And you ultimately end up with a very unique civilization, which is not really Portuguese or maybe African. It's both. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth noting how often Darwin mentions the color of their skin, whether it's the babies or the women or the priest. As a white Victorian man coming from a predominantly white country, he would not have experienced much of this. There were black people that lived in England at the time, but he would not have been used to ever being the minority in his skin color. Yeah, that's true. And for his readers too, remarking on the skin color again reminds them to envision a place that's different from mm -hmm. their own home, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next reading I wanted to take a look at takes place all the way over in South America. So Charles Darwin and the crew of the Beagle are now in a place called Maldonado, which is located in modern-day Uruguay. He writes, At night we came to the house of Don Juan Fuentes, a rich landed proprietor, but not personally known to either of my companions. On approaching the house of a stranger, it is usual to follow several little points of etiquette. Riding up slowly to the door, the salutation of Ave Maria is given, and until somebody comes out and asks you to alight, it is not customary even to get off your horse. The formal answer of the owner is, Sin pecado concebida, that is, conceived without sin. Having entered the house, some general conversation is kept for a few minutes, 
till permission is asked to pass the night there. This is granted as a matter of course. The stranger then takes his meals with the family, and a room is assigned him, where with the horse cloths belonging to his ricado, or saddle of the pampas, he makes his bed. It is curious how similar circumstances produce such similar results and manners. At the Cape of Good Hope, the same hospitality, and very nearly the same points of etiquette, are universally observed. The difference, however, between the character of the Spaniard and that of the Dutch Boer is shown by the former never asking his guest a single question beyond the strictest rule of politeness, whilst the honest Dutchman demands where he has been, where he's going, what is his business, and even how many brothers, sisters, or children he may happen to have. Shortly after our arrival at Don Juan's, one of the largest herds of cattle was driven in towards the house, and three beasts were picked out to be slaughtered for the supply of the establishment. These half-wild cattle are very active. After witnessing the rude wealth displayed in the number of cattle, men, and horses, Don Juan's miserable house was quite curious. The floor consisted of hardened mud, and the windows were without glass. The sitting room boasted only of a few of the roughest chairs and stools, with a couple of tables. The supper, although several strangers were present, consisted of two huge piles, one of roast beef, the other of boiled, with some pieces of pumpkin. Besides this latter, there was no other vegetable, and not even a morsel of bread. For drinking, a large earthenware jug of water served the whole party. Yet this man was the owner of several square miles of land, of which nearly every acre would produce corn, and with a little trouble, all the common vegetables. The evening was spent in smoking, with a little impromptu singing accompanied by the guitar. The senoritas all sat together in one corner of the room, and did not sup with the men. Now, the reason I wanted to read this excerpt is not so much that it gives us an insight into what it was like to be a Victorian, but more so what it was like to travel the world in the Victorian era. And the things that Darwin remarks on here, I think, are kind of funny. He talks about the type of food they're eating, maybe even his dissatisfaction with the way the land is managed. But this is a cultural difference here, a cultural divide between the Spanish and the English that he's noting. Anyway, I just thought it was an interesting story he included in the book, and I thought we should include in this episode. And finally, our last excerpt for this episode is Charles Darwin in the Galapagos Islands, which Ava will read for us. The remaining land birds form a most singular group of finches related to each other in the structure of their beaks, short tails, form of body, and plumage. There are 13 species, which Mr. Gould has divided into four subgroups. All these species are peculiar to this archipelago, and so is the whole group, with the exception of one species of the subgroup, Cactornis, lately brought from Bow Island in the Low Archipelago. Of Cactornis, the two species may be often seen climbing about the flowers of the great cactus tree, but all the other species of this group of finches mingle together in flocks, feed on the dry and sterile ground of the lower districts. The males of all, or certainly of the greater number, are jet black, and the females, with perhaps one or two exceptions, are brown. The most curious fact is the perfect gradation in the size of the beaks in the different species of the Geospitza, from one as large as that of a whorefinch to that of a chaffinch. And, if Mr. Gold is right in including his subgroup, Cythidia, in the main group, even to that of a warbler. The largest beak in the genus Geospitza is shown in figure 1, and the smallest in figure 3. But instead of there being only one intermediate species with a beak of the size shown in figure 2, there are no less than six species with insensibly graduated beaks. The beak of the subgroup Cythidia is shown in figure 4. The beak of Cactornis is somewhat like that of a starling, and that of the fourth subgroup, Camarhynchus, is slightly parrot-shaped. Seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small, intimately related group of birds, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, one species had been taken and modified for different ends. In a like manner, it might be fancied that a bird, originally a buzzard, had been induced here to undertake the office of the carrion-feeding polybori of the American continent. When he says paucity in this instance, that means scarcity, by the way. So these are Darwin's finches, and as Ava mentioned earlier, if you've taken high school biology, you may be familiar with these. So we'll post an image you may have seen before to our website, which is his illustrations of the finches. But what's remarkable about this? This is essentially what you learn in high school biology in the primary source itself. This is him discovering the fact that all these different finches that 
are essentially the same that are found on these different islands in the Galapagos have adapted to the environments that they are existing in. So he notes the fact that they have different shaped beaks and Darwin determined that over time, each species had adapted to the ecosystems and the available food sources of their respective islands. I think what's really unique and what probably really piqued Darwin's interest is the fact that these islands were so close in proximity and yet these birds had developed differently. Yes, and he's most taken aback by the fact that there's not just, you know, three types of beak, he said. He said there's not just, you know, the small beak, the big beak, and the intermediary. There's multiple different gradations of beak size, all suited specifically for the environment that those finches would have existed within. And that was his eureka moment, was looking at these birds and realizing there must be something that's causing this to happen. And eventually lead to his theory of natural selection. So there you have it, guys. That is some excerpts from The Voyage of the Beagle, a really fascinating read. If you want to pick up a copy, we got our copy on Amazon. You can find one there for sure. Thanks so much, as always, for listening to the podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can reach us at theirownwordspod at gmail.com. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.